Okay, perfect. I think we're all set up to go now. Hi, everyone. Many thanks for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Blundell. I'm the International Marketing Manager here at Premier Codex. I'm going to be your host today, so I'm just going to run you through some details first and then we can get started. So welcome. This is our second webinar in our Code Analysis and EOR series. We have our Global Technical Manager, Jules Reed here today and presenting for you. And he will be sharing with us some insights into how we may be able to revisit our core and data that we already have and be able to gain a deep, much deeper understanding and value from this. We do hope you'll get as much as you can from our session today. So we'd encourage you to interact with us as much as you want and participate with us. And of course, feel free to ask Jules any questions you might have throughout. You can ask Jules your, Jules your questions by entering them into the Q&A in your control panel, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. There is a chat function available as well, but if you do have specific questions you would like Jules to answer during the session, it's best just to use this Q&A and he'll be able to see them in there. Uh, anything that can be answered easily, we'll stop every so often to answer these for you. We'll aim for the session to last around 45 minutes to an hour today. If there are any questions which may be a bit more in depth or might need a fuller answer, we may leave these until the end, but we can go back to them and then we'll also factor in some further time for questions at the end as well. So I can now pass you over to Jules Reed, our presenter today, and he will just give you a short intro and then he'll get us all started. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining uh, today. We'll be, as Jennifer said, we'll be looking at uh, leveraging legacy core and maximizing metadata. Um, you might gather from the title that I like to alliterate, um, which is fine uh, when um, it's written, but uh, makes it a bit difficult in speaking, um, especially if you have a list or some or some other issue. Uh, so, as uh, Jennifer said, I'm Jules. Uh, I'll be um, taking through the uh, presentation today. Um, I have almost 30 years of experience in, in the industry. Uh, it will be 30 years later in June. So I'm getting closer and closer to my industry birthday. Um, a number of years ago, I was um, lucky enough to publish uh, together with a couple of colleagues, uh, best practice guidebook. Um, and I'm a former president of the SCA and uh, currently a uh, peer review for a couple of journals. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, just one slide about um, who we are as well, um, who Premier Oilfield Group or Premier, um, Premier Corex are, if you've not heard of us before. Um, the group began in, uh, it was formed in 2016, uh, purchased a number of labs globally. There's a little um, globe there, or a layout of a globe. Uh, showing where our laboratories are. And in 2016, they bought uh, Corex, um, which has been doing core analysis since the 70s, late 70s. Um, we, we have a number of different areas that we uh, perform analyses in, from geochemistry, conventional core and, and special core, all the way through to um, some of the unconventional uh, systems, and unconventional plays and EOR. So let's uh, begin, uh, when we start beginning to look at leveraging legacy core, uh, why might be, we be using uh, legacy core? And, and as we're all aware, our industry has gone through a bit of a downturn about five years ago and the last uh, four or five years have been um, quite difficult. Uh, things were beginning to come back. Um, and then we have our current lockdown situations and um, things began to worsen again. And during that period, there's uh, not a lot of core being taken. And so um, what we wanted to look at is, can we get, um, can we optimize using what we already have? Um, and so there are, as we begin to think about that, there are a number of questions that we want to ask. Um, as we begin to look at um, leveraging our legacy core, we want to, Think about what types of core do we have available? Um, 
what condition is the available material in, uh, and then and what analysis is possible for the particular type of core, because certain types of core, we won't be able to do all the potential analyses on particular types of core. And, and then thinking about the data that we already have, can we do things to improve our knowledge of the data that we already have? Uh, and we'll look at some um, typical data uh, and then look at what types of metadata it's important to have. Um, so as we start to think about what types of core we have, probably one of the first things we might want to ensure is that we know what core we have. We make sure that we have a database of our different uh, core material, uh, where it is stored uh, and, and of what conditions it's in, et cetera. Um, so that would be the first, first thing. It makes it so much easier to then look down a list of core material and find what type of core you've got available, where it is, uh, and, and, and how it's currently stored. Um, and what I've done here is listed a number of different types of core material that might be available, um, and really putting them here in preference of order of, of, of how they might be used. And of course, the first, uh, um, pref the most preferable method uh, would be preserved whole core section or preserved core plugs. So these first two are, are very similar. Um, there, are, there are different reasons why you might use preserved whole core sections against preserved core plugs. Um, you can imagine here in the, in the picture at the bottom where we've got a number of different cores, a number of different markings from the same piece of rock. You can, if that is a nice homogenous piece of core, you can get several uh, samples from the same piece of core, each having very similar or equal properties. Um, and so if, if you, you're requiring several core plugs or several analyses on basically the same piece of rock, um, then a whole core section is an excellent uh, piece of material to use. Um, the picture there is showing you a wax preser preservation. Um, what, we're, what the wax does is it seals the core off from the atmosphere. It reduces, well, it, it seals off um, and makes sure that we don't have evaporation of any of the fluids that are in there. Um, and so that when we open that sample again after a number of years, and it could be 20, 30 years down the line, um, what we have inside the core has been preserved over that time. We also then have preserved core plugs, and basically the, similar, the process is exactly the same. Uh, we might wrap the sample in a plastic film first, a, a sort of oil resistant plastic film, then a uh, aluminium foil, and then into uh, a wax to again seal the sample off from the atmosphere, and preserve the contents of that sample. If we start using whole core sections and we're taking plugs from the whole core, then what you may end up is something that might look like this, where you have several uh, samples have already been taken. There's not a lot of, um, of rock material remaining, but there is rock material remaining. And we call that the carcass. And, and that would normally be re-preserved after uh, samples and plugs have been taken from that. Now, on this particular picture, you may not be able to get additional plugs or standard core plugs from it, but there is material there, and that material will be basically preserved uh, if, if it's being placed back into that wax dip. And that could be used for various different types of testing. And, and we'll look at the um, possible tests that are available for what type of material later. The next type of core you may have is used core plugs. Now, of course, these are not going to be, or may not be, as good as preserved whole cores. Um, there, there may be a, a, um, a more limited variability of analysis types on these samples, but they are still usable. Um, we have core plugs here that may have been cleaned and dried and are available for reuse as long as their condition is reasonable. 
Um, we then also have, uh, in a similar vein to the used core plugs, we may have sidewall cores as well. And they may be not quite as good as, as the core plugs. It all depends on the quality of the sidewall core. Um, but uh, if they are in a reasonable shape, um, and then and we do some due diligence on uh, their um, integrity and the mineralogy and orientation and things like this, and they might be usable as well. Um, I, just one quick question that's come up. You, I use the term wax. Um, this is not paraffin wax, is it? Um, is that still used anywhere? Um, it's actually, a, I don't know the exact makeup of, of the wax. The, the wax that is used these days, um, which looks like um, this one here, the, um, this light colored wax, is a low temperature. Um, um, it, it, so it's liquid at low temperature. Um, so it's much safer. Uh, the old waxes used to have to heat to 180 or 200 degrees. Um, this wax you can um, heat it at maybe 40, 50 degrees. Um, part of the reason of using the aluminium foil is to, um, and, the, and then the plastic wrap, is to ensure that the wax isn't getting into the sample. So after um, sidewall cores and used plugs, um, we also then uh, have slabbed core. Now, this is not as good as, as used core plugs. Um, there are limitations to a slab core. Um, some of those uh, uh, limitations are that we, we may not know what fluid has been used to slab the core. Um, we also have a limited length of the, of the sample um, because we've now cut the core. Um, we then also will have or may have entrims or cuttings. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a picture on, on the right showing you a sample here in the middle uh, with maybe a couple of uh, outer end trims and a very extremity uh, uh, trim. Um, those end trims, um, some of those may have been used for things like petrographic analysis or mercury injection, capillary um, pressure. Um, uh, but some, many of them uh, will be uh, stored. Uh, some of them may be stored in, and preserved. Some of them may be just in plastic uh, bags labeled up with the sample that they came from. Um, but those material may be available and, and those material might be of use. Uh, and then there are cuttings as well. And of course, cuttings, um, we may not have core together with cuttings. Um, but most wells will have cuttings. Now, again, then it's not perfect, um, but if it's the only material you have, um, there sometimes can be um, good data available from cutting material. So those are the types of core that are available. And as I said before, it, it would be good to have a record of what material you have available and where it is. But we then have to consider the condition of that material. Um, how usable is that? And of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, the preserved core is the best type of material as long as the preservation has, um, has worked. And um, one of my colleagues would, will re, uh, recognize these images. Um, this is a sample that uh, is, has, should have been wax preserved. Um, the wax preservation here is not being great. Um, there are potential holes in, in the wax. Um, that this the image reminded people of, of uh, something that looks like this. Uh, and people from uh, in, in the north of Scotland are very well aware of one of these because this is a, a deep fried Mars bar. Reality of deep fried Scottish food. Um, we have to ask the question, has the preservation of that core remained intact throughout its storage? And one of the ways that we can do that, we can look at weight, weight checks. So we should weigh the samples before it's placed into wax preservation. We can then weigh the sample after the wax preservation. And if they're the same weight, 
then basically nothing has changed uh, through that process. With no fluids have evaporated um, throughout that storage period. Um, but we need to um, make those checks. Once we've obtained samples from that, and this could be a whole core sample or it could be a, a preserved um, core plug sample, one, and, one inch or one and a half inch. Um, once we start preparing those samples and we do um, cleaning or we make some measurements of uh, porosity or permeability, we should compare those properties back to our legacy data. Are the properties equivalent to our legacy properties? If not, then um, the, our samples may have changed over that time. If they're equal, then, then there's a good chance that we've got good, uh, a good sample that is usable. And that can be, I've known samples that have been used 20 or 30 years after they were originally um, obtained from a coring process. The next one is the, the used core plugs. Now, what, what are the decisions we need to uh, make about used core plugs? Well, the, one of the first ones is what's the condition of the plug? Is it still intact as a cylindrical plug? Because we are going to be placing these samples into perfectly cylindrical equipment. And the more non-cylindrical, or the less integrity there is in the sample itself, the more likely that we're going to have problems of things like um, a failure of the equipment, leakages into the, through the sample, as you may get punctures through the rubber sleeve that surrounds the sample. So we, we have to look at the shape of the sample and the integrity of the sample. We then also need to consider things like the mineralogy of the sample, because there are certain minerals that, um, together with the testing that has been performed, there are certain minerals that may have caused problems and may have caused uh, changes to the sample and the sample property. And one of those might be things, something like kaolinite, uh, where the, the cleaning, the flooding, and, and then additional cleaning may weaken kaolinite booklets. You may then have induced fines migration. Um, and so you might want to do testing for, for that before you start using the samples. Um, also things, uh, another mineral that you might want to think about is smectite. Of course, smectite is a swelling clay. Uh, we then need to consider what the impact of cleaning um, of resaturating with the water, we need to make sure that we've got a good handle of the, our water salinity and that it's not causing problems with those clays that are through the various cycles of testing. And so what we will do is, is do a pre-study to look at that, um, then uh, consider the, those properties again. So measure the properties, look at things like the dry weight, is the dry weight the same or the grain density equivalent to the pre its previous data. Um, the porosity and the gas permeability. Now these are being performed on samples where these measurements have been performed before. And so we should be, have a direct comparison and they should be e equal within um, standard measurement error. But of course, with these routine core plugs, the one measurement that you are always unable to make is fresh state uh, analysis. Because with fresh state, it can only ever be fresh once. And that's what, uh, when we first obtain the sample from a core, take a plug from that core and begin to use it directly after that, that core process. The next um, set of potential uh, material you might have is slabbed core. Now, what, what are the, um, uh, just, uh, I was forgetting one thing about the, these core plugs. One, one of the things that um, we often do or uh, is often done in the industry when we don't have material from our own reservoir is we look at analog material. Um, and so quite, a, quite often you might be using things like outcrop rock. Um, where the outcrop rock is basically your reservoir rock, but that it's been exposed um, to the atmosphere and it's being exposed to weathering and to the elements. Um, some of the um, minerals may be slightly different and it may have slightly different properties to your actual reservoir rock, but without any actual reservoir core, um, then it, it's maybe the next best thing. Now, these um, 
you previously used core plugs are going to be potentially better than an output block as long as you've done this due diligence of ensuring uh, that the properties are similar. Um, but quite often, used core plugs can be used over and over again. And it's one of the, um, the beauties of, of, of analysis with clean state or restored state analysis. Um, you can take a plug, you can clean it, saturate it, you can measure the properties, you can then re-clean it, um, measure the properties and saturate and measure the properties. And each time it should be uh, consistent. It should be showing elastic properties um, and, and should be showing no thought signs of hysteresis. If that's happening, then you're very, uh, it's very easy to see that that sample can be used over and over again uh, to show the, the reservoir properties and to be represented. Slab core, what do we need to do with slab core? Well, we have to consider core consolidation. We have to consider what slabbing fluid was used because um, it could have been done uh, in water or a saline water, in oil, or with air. And um, if it's been, uh, if you go back 20 years, slab core was probably done with tap water. And that's if you've got lots of sensitive water sensitive minerals present that's not going to be good um, there's also over time the fluids in this slab core will be evaporating that could lead to salt precipitation salt precipitation could lead to weakening uh, depending on where it precipitates um, it could lead to weakening of the structure um, and and so you may end up with uh, uh, with this slab core um, degrading in quality over time and over the number of years that it's, it's stored. And so one of the tests might be to look at, uh, as well as just looking at pro standard properties, look at things like rock strength, um, perform a, a UCS or unconfined compressive strength and check that it, you've got similar properties to the original core, if that data is available. And of course, again, on slab core, um, if, you cannot get fresh state analysis. Um, then the other material that's uh, available or potentially available is end trims and cuttings. Um, I showed the picture earlier of the, of the end trims. Um, some of those may have been preserved. Some of those may have just been sat in plastic bags, which um, reduces its uh, exposure to an atmosphere, but doesn't um, doesn't cut it off completely, um, but you have those that uh, material there, and and what we have in uh, potential, particularly in cuttings, we have um, limited material. We have um, small um, pieces and irregular sizes, um, but this is uh, there in the states and, and in unconventional plays. Um, this. Crushed rock analysis is used um, consistently um, to, for those processes. And if you've got any piece of core, you can crush it. Now, there, of course, there are the potential issues. There may be um, mud invasion. And so we may, we may need to do some study to look at the impact of that. There may be fracturing, um, which, which we need to study to look at that. But there are a number of different analyses that are still available and potential to be performed on small pieces of, of rock. So what, what types of analysis are available and for what types of, of the core that we see? Well. Um, the first one is the crush rock analysis, which obviously can be performed on just about any type of um, core material that you have available. Um, if you can, if you have a piece and you can crush it, you can make crush rock analysis. Um, but over the past five or ten years, there have been a number of um, of developments in imaging, uh, improving of resolution of different types of imaging techniques that can give lots of additional information than was available, say, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so the, there's a potential that we can go back to some of those old core and maybe perform some of these newer imaging processes to look at what's 
uh, what's there now. Some of those things might be something like ChemScan, uh, which I'll show a, a quick picture of, or um, infrared spectroscopy, or X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. There's also um, di uh, digital rock properties, uh, where we take small, very small plugs um, and perform analyses on, on uh, imaging analysis, and then um, something like lattice Boltzmann simulations um, out from those properties. Um, you could perform MICP data, and of course, um, going from a, a plug sample um, down to a small size of sample makes the potential error slightly increase. So you may have some higher uncertainties, but if it's the only material that's available to you, you may still be able to get good, useful information out of that from mercury injection capillary pressure and, and from that something like poor throat size distribution. Um, and from there you can uh, derive other types of rock properties. So still a very useful um, measurements that can be performed on these uh, cuttings. Um, and then recently a number of papers have been uh, written looking at um, the uh, NMR on cuttings and the potential um, extraction of, of core data using NMR on them. Um, things like porosity and permeability correlation on that. Um, so this is just showing you a, a image of, of ChemScan that's taking um, cuttings. Um, it's uh, placing it into an SEM analysis with backscatter, um, X-ray backscatter analysis with EDS or um, electrospectroscopy. Uh, and uh, are getting elemental uh, spectral maps of the different materials. Now, if you understand of the different depths that these cuttings have come from, then you can begin to map different mineralogies, or you can uh, derive mineralogy from the, the um, spectral elements, um, and then look at uh, different mineralogies and place it in depths and look at uh, changes in properties as a function of depth. Um, you, you have this, this is infrared mapping, and this is one of the other images, uh, imaging techniques I was um, talking about earlier. Um, so on this, you're um, allowing infrared um, imaging across the whole core, maybe the slabbed core, um, and from the infrared, the different spectral peaks, you're able to um, calculate, again, the, the uh, spectral elemental composition. And from that, you can determine the different components that make up that image. So in this particular case, we can see chlorite. We can see then changes where chlorite is in abundance at the lower part, where we've got little chlorite thereafter. And that's a change in rock type at that um, natural marker there. Um, we can see then a mica and then different liquid positions there as well. And so um, it can be a very powerful tool. And when you then place that together into your petrophysical description, you can begin to see where changes in uh, elemental maps uh, may inter interact with changes in cluster analysis or changes in your electrofashies or, or other statistical methods that you're using to differentiate the different layers of your reservoir. And, and so this can be a very useful tool and can be performed on core that is already there available, um, but this technique wasn't available when your core was taken. Um, and then digital rock properties. And what, what the digital rock uh, process does, um, it, this is showing you how we're getting down from say a whole core process down into the sub-micron um, Pore structure and pore structure. So uh, we have a whole core on the left. We take our core sample out of, uh, from that core, and so this may be a one and a half inch sample there. And, and from that core sample, we can take a sub micro sample, um, and that micro sample there is about the same size as uh, as the pen lid or the pencil lid of of one of these retractable pencils. So that's to give you an idea of the scale of the sample that we're looking at. And, and then uh, the scale of the of maybe the heterogeneity or the layer that you might be able to look at. That sample can be placed into um, micro 
uh, micro CT, X-ray imaging um, uh, equipment. And, and from the image that's gained, then we can, the, the, the tools, the software tools that are available can calculate from the different um, X-ray imaging and the resolutions we can, and the densities there, we can determine different portions of matrix. So different grain types, different mineralogies, um, different fluids that are present. Um, and once we've got a map of our pore space, sorry, someone, someone's just asked, asked if there is any software to make uh, pore scale modeling. Um, yeah, there are a number of um, types of software out there. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go through all the software, but um, we, we can maybe discuss that outside of the, outside of the meeting or at the end. Um, so once you've got a poor map, you can begin to predict or, um, or history match uh, per, things like porosity and permeability from those data. Um, it may not be perfect, um, and it will require some legacy data to try and history match your, um, your current sample data into some previous data um, so that you're, you're tuning your model uh, from that system. But once you've tuned the model, you can then begin to do multi-phase um, rock properties, something like, say, a capillary pressure curve. And in this particular case, this was one sample that had uh, within the sample and the heterogeneity of the sample, it had two different rock types. Um, and we were able to sub-sample the two different rock types get the um, information, the capillary pressure data for those, and then put those together into uh, the, the larger scale sample. So those, those are things we can do with our, our legacy core. What about our metadata or our, our legacy data? How do we get the best out of the data that we already have? And what do we mean by metadata? Um, so what I will do through this is, is look at some uh, uh, data um, and the standard sort of data that you may get, get from uh, a laboratory report um, or a, a data package that is sent to you. Um, then we'll look at what sort of metadata is important um, and, then, and look at the importance of understand, understanding those metadata um, in a couple of case studies. So the, fir the first question would be, well, what's the problem uh, with the data? What's the problem with acquire, um, data then that I may already have? And one of the major problems I would suggest is that you have this, um, this split between knowledge. So the company personnel, the petrophysicists, the geologists, reservoir engineers, they know their reservoir, but they may not know core analysis. Uh, the lab, they you know core analysis, but not the specific reservoirs. Um, and, and so there's a bit of a, 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 a knowledge split. Now, what would be better is if they spoke together um, and shared the information. Um, and, and so uh, if the lab was supplied with additional information about the reservoir, they could maybe look at using those data and, and, and backing out different um, interpretations or looking at different correlations from those data and basically what we mean by metadata is, ba is basically anything that um, has been done to the core. Um, a couple of weeks ago I was speaking about the coring and the, the impact that coring can have on core analysis um, and I, I talked about the cause and effect. So the cause is anything that we do to the core the effect is that, that what we do can have an impact on the results. Um, so if we do something that is incorrect, then it can have a, a negative impact on our results. And, and the one question to ask is, is the core data plug and play? So what I mean by that is, is, can you take core data as provided and just plug it into a reservoir model? Well, I, I, I'll 
switch that round a little and, and ask the same question about well log data. Is your well log data plug and play? Would any petrophysicist take the well logs directly as they have them, plug it into their model and just run it uh, without any, any additional um, uh, tweaking or calibrations or thought? And the answer would be no. Um, you would take uh, log data, you would reconsider those data, and you would implement alternative offsets than are in those data. And it's exactly the same with core data. You need to take the core data and you need to consider those core data in the light of all your other data in that reservoir. Um, so what are the, the, the data? Well, let's just look at, take this one example. Here's a set of data. Um, this is maybe as you will get it from a routine core analysis. You've got plug, you've got depth, rain density, porosity, and permeability. And on the right there, we have what from those data? Um, and we can see that's quite a spread of, uh, of permeability um, for quite a small um, uh, spread of porosity. Um, a little, around about 15% porosity spread, uh, but over four magnitudes of change in permeability. So is there any better way of, of understanding those data? Well, we could get additional data because the lab has these data, we might get grain volume um, and bulk volume, pore volumes. Uh, the grain volume will, uh, uh, and bulk volume, that helps us to understand the porosity data. And we can make our own calculations and check that we agree with the porosity and we find that these are, are, are reasonable. So the data on the right stands as it is. Um, we might have length and diameter data and, and dry weight. Um, the dry weight allows us to check the grain density and make sure that those agree. Um, and, that and we can then look down the grain density data and we see one sample that is significantly different than all the others down at the bottom there at 2.74. And we can begin to ask questions about that one sample. But we also see that it's, it's the, the one with the lowest porosity. So it might be expected as well. Um, so, uh, the, the data still potentially stands. Um, let's look at other um, variables, other metadata, and that is that four of these samples were fractured. Now, most laboratories would inform you of this, and they may not even report the, the fractured permeability. Um, but those fractured permeability are those highest ones there on, on, on the plot. Um, and we can begin to say, well, we actually don't believe these data um, because they come in, they're from fractured core. Um, what we're measuring is the fracture matrix. Um, and other metadata, rock type. And so then we, we're looking at rock type in there and then the picture becomes a lot clearer that we have two different rock types. Um, and we can begin, instead of having one big spread of data, we've now got two much finer um, with uh, uh, data ranges with a lower uncertainty between the two different rock types. So I've shown just on, on here things like noting fractures, noting rock types, what, what other data is necessary? And I would say as much as possible. Um, I can't actually show you all of the columns on this file. Um, this file would have, or this sheet would have over 300 columns of data. Um, and that's typically what you would get when you're beginning to look at these, um, looking at all the different variables of that system, um, looking at what data is, is there available and beginning to, to map it and, and put, place it into a database. So what, what sort of data is it will, would we put into there? Well, here's a list of various different things that went into that particular um, spreadsheet that you couldn't see. Uh, there's uh, the field, the well, um, the operator, the coring contractor, what mud has been used, um, whether traces have been used. Um, we're then looking at then um, in the middle section, there are some reservoir pertinent aspects like the zone fasces, formation, you might put litho fasces in there, um, 
sample types, the sample orientation, um, and then things that have happened to the, the, the that that core, whether the core was mounted or not, what material was being used, all of these things you note, and these are not standardly reported. Many of these things, all you get is a set of data. So you need to have a discussion with the laboratory. The laboratory will normally still have much of this information about the data that they have um, created, unless it's really old, uh, where the, the data may have been um, with data storage, uh, they're only required to keep it for so many years. But that those these sort of information may still be available, and I recommend getting as much of this as possible because then you can begin to um, uh, see within my data do my data um, correlate out along some of those different metadata, so other meta important metadata, the lab, what dates, the method that was used, the fluids, the fluid properties, temperature pressure, equipment, all of these things um, can have an impact on uh, the um, data that we are measuring. Um, and, and we need to um, compile that into a, a database and begin to correlate al along those different things. And it's time consuming, uh, and, uh, but it can be worth it. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of case studies. Um, one of them is a, a case study where uh, we had a field across two license blocks. And so in each license box, there were two operators, um, but there was, a sing uh, there was a partner who saw across both license blocks. And they saw um, uh, different properties, but it was the same lab, and the lab was using exactly the same procedures, um, except stabilization and, and so for stabilization I mean this process here that I'm showing um, on this slide and the, at the well site as the core comes to surface um, the, the core is stabilized so either by gypsum or by foam injection we uh, um, put this uh, surrounding the core and stop it from moving now this particular core was unconsolidated and so what the stabilization was doing was stopping the, the unconsolidated core slumping um, and, uh, and moving and changing properties. Um, what that meant was that there was actually a four porosity units difference on average between one side of the, of the reservoir that was um, with one operator using stabilization compared to the other side where, st where the stabilization was not being used. Despite the lab recommending to the operator that it should be stabilized because it was unconsolidated. And a four porosity units difference is a massive difference in um, calculation of, of stock tank oil in place. So slumping was occurring that changed the properties cause a four porosity unit difference between the two different sides. And the only difference between all of that was that the, the core was stabilized in one system. And, and so it was important to understand just that one parameter across the whole of a, the, the rest of the um, procedures. And this, another case, um, looking at um, an unconsolidated mix of clay and sand, uh, where um, there were some unusual properties of certain portions of, of that sand as it got into a more clay-rich area, that the, the samples had been frozen um, with, and then cleaning with toluene and methan, methanol. And for some reason, the freezing plus toluene and methanol um, cr created like a, a, a cement-like um, uh, system. So the sample solidified. What was an unconsolidated mass of clay and sand became a solid mass. And so then the properties have changed, um, the structure had changed, and, and it was all because of the cl that cl one cleaning process. So understanding the cleaning process and the cleaning method, and plus together with freezing, um, was, was necessary part of understanding what was happening with those samples. So 
thank you for your attention today. Um, hopefully you've gained some uh, under, uh, little understanding of the complexities of first knowing what material you have available, of, um, of doing some due diligence about the condition of the, that material. And then uh, in terms of our data, trying to just amass as much of that data together into a database and begin to look at correlations between um, the, the different metadata that's available and what I'm seeing in my trend. Um, and that's uh, in, an important process to understand in, in using our data and reducing uncertainty. So thank you for your attention. Um, and if anybody has any, any questions, we'll um, open the floor to questions. There's just the uh, the questions that we had there from from um, earlier. Um, in terms of software for um, modeling, uh, um, poor scale uh, modeling, um, there are a number of different ones. There's one called uh, Simpleware. There's um, one called Aviso, um, and a number of universities have built their 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 own. Um, it, it's worth um, just looking up and researching into digital rock properties um, and, and uh, finding uh, the places that might be able to, to help you there. Um, if you have any questions, then please feel free to contact uh, myself or Jennifer as well. My email is, is here on this page uh, along with Jennifer's. Um, there's uh, yeah, uh, it's not a question, it's just uh, someone saying thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, hand over, if there are no other questions just now, I'm going to hand over to, to Jennifer uh, and she will um, close out uh, the session for us. Thanks very much, Jules, and thank you everyone. We appreciate your time today. Yeah, as Jules said, if you do have any further questions, you can, of course, contact us directly. Uh, we will also be sending out a link to the webinar recording tomorrow in our follow-up email. So you can revisit the slides then if you would like. And if you have any questions, then yeah, just let us know. Uh, you can also see some of our webinar videos up on Premier Oil Free Group and Premier Corex YouTube channel shortly. Um, so if you're interested, please subscribe and you'll be able to get updates on when they will be available and released. Look out for Jules, he will be back presenting again in a few weeks time on the 11th of June with the next core analysis and EOR session. This one's titled Wettability Essential but Meaningless. And here Jules will take a look at some of the basic wettability controls, how it's changed, what can go wrong, and also look at current wettability measurement methods that are needed to ensure representative core data. Next Thursday, so next week, 28th of May, we'll be holding the third webinar in our formation damage series. What types of formation damage could I see in my injection well? With Justin Green, he'll be back and he will be looking at the types of damaging mechanisms typically seen in injectors, what injection water can do to the reservoir and how these issues are examined in studies. So please keep an eye out on our social pages, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, etc. for more information and you'll be able to see the registration details on there shortly. And of course, as always, if you do have any specific topics you would like to see from us, please just feel free to get in touch and we're more than happy to work together and cater to anything specific for you and your team. So we thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you next time.